Well, we're continuing in our series through Romans chapter 8, so you can grab a Bible and join me there. If you don't have a Bible, there's some underneath the seats, and Romans 8 is on page 944 there. And we're seeing in this series that uh, real Christianity brings together both gospel doctrine, thinking about truth, and life in the Spirit, experience and practical living through the power of the Holy Spirit, um, which we just sung about as well. So let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your great kindness in giving us the letter of Romans and this chapter in particular and all the wonderful truths and realities that you have told us about in this. So we pray that since this is your word, that you would work this into our minds and our hearts, transform our wills. Let us live differently in light of this. We're eager and expectant for you to do what only you can do. And so we pray that you would open us to your work by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Romans chapter 8, we'll be in verses 9 to 11. We'll read that in a few moments, but uh, as we get into this text, I'm sure uh, many of you have heard about uh, what some are calling the revival at Asbury University. So it's kind of hit some of the mainstream news outlets as well. So a week and a half ago, if you're not familiar, uh, the students there met for a typical chapel, but the chapel service didn't end. They continued meeting with prayer and singing and Bible teaching and stories of God's work and engaging with God's Word. And so the chapel has been nearly uh, nonstop um, full ever since, and similar things are now being reported happen at other uh, schools and areas. And so you can find a lot of takes on what's going on. Um, even just any time you hear about this in any kind of news outlet, there is a, t- a, t- a take, a view of what's going on, positive, negative, cynical, exciting. Um, and this is because a lot of people want to know what to make of this. And I'm not here this morning to give the final word on that. I've not been there. Uh, But this moment for us uh, as Christians, especially in America, as this is hitting uh, the forefront, at least at some times and in some circles, um, it's an opportunity for us to consider some important questions. And Christians should be able to answer them. Like, does God do this kind of thing? Should we want Him to do this kind of thing? Should we pray for him to do that kind of thing? Should we expect him to do this? How can we know if a particular experience is actually from him? What should our posture be towards stories of revival? Christians should be able to answer those questions. So the Bible helps us answer them. The message of the Bible is about a God who loves to give life. That is at the heart of the message of the Bible. From the first page, we see that God created the world and He filled it with life. And although our sin has brought death, He now is committed to bring spiritually dead people to life and continue to renew them. Jesus said that He came that His people might have abundant life in John 10. So that's not just continuing existence. This is the fullness of what we were made for, that we would be fully alive. After his resurrection, he ascended to the heaven and he poured out his Holy Spirit. And do you remember what happened when he did that several weeks after his resurrection? 3,000 people heard the gospel preached through Peter and became Christians. Mega church overnight. 3,000 Christians renewed life refreshment from God. His idea couldn't be manipulated. He just did it. Life-giving power through the Holy Spirit spread ever since then through every generation, culture after culture, people group after people group. There's still, as we just heard this morning, there's still people groups that are unreached. There's places where the gospel has gone and the wave of His grace has receded and it needs renewing and reviving. In a sense, the New Testament, New Testament Christianity is itself a revival movement. It is the God who loves to give life and renewal, pouring out His Spirit. The gospel hits in, 
Jerusalem through the resurrection and the outpoured spirit. And it's like waves have been splashing over the planet in different places at different times because the spirit does what he wants when he wants. It'll splash and it'll recede. We can't just start making ourselves feel wet. We can't demand that he moves the wave over here. We see a receding of his waves, and, but we can eagerly hope for and expect him to keep doing this. He's a God who loves to give life. And there are times then where God works above and beyond what he normally does in a place or a time. He sends a fresh wave of renewal in some place in time. So revival is when God's Spirit works in such a powerful way among a people or a place or in a time that it's just non-ignorable to everybody. True revival is a Spirit-given, Christ-centered surge of spiritual renewal. The spiritual growth that we usually experience over the course of years or a decade seems to happen over the course of days or weeks. It happens when Christians are drawn closer to Jesus and renewed in their affections for Him and their lives and in faith and repentance, and other people who do not yet know Jesus are drawn to Christ in surprising numbers. We can't manipulate this into existence. You can't schedule a revival. We will never say we're hosting a revival meeting at 6 p.m. on Saturday night. We do not force the Spirit to work, but we wait, we pray, we long, and if He sends it, we steward it by His grace. And so that's New Testament Christianity, revival movement. In Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 11, The verses we just happen to be coming to as we're moving through Romans chapter 8 gives us insight into true revival. It shows that where revival, it shows where revival comes from, and it also shows us how every Christian has its seed already planted in them. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit, the giver of life. If you are a Christian, you have the source of and the power and the beginning of revival inside of you already. So these three verses show us three realities that are true of everyone who has the Holy Spirit, which is every real Christian. Uh, The three are you live in the new realm of the Spirit. It's verse 9. You experience new life by the Spirit. It's verse 10. And your body will be resurrected, given new life, through the Holy Spirit. So, three verses, three realities. First, first reality, if you have the Holy Spirit, let's read it first, huh? Then we'll walk through them. Okay, chapter 8, verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies." through His Spirit who dwells in you. So you can see here over and over, this is about the power of the Holy Spirit to give life, right? Spirit referred to in a number of different ways, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, and then we have Christ living in us by the Spirit, the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is in us. This is about the Holy Spirit giving life to us. So first reality, verse 9, is this, you live in the new realm of the Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you live in the new realm of the Spirit. When someone becomes becomes a Christian, they're brought into a whole new realm or sphere of existence. They're taken out of one way of life and brought into a new one. So this is verse 9. Let's look at this again. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. 
So the assumption here is that every Christian has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. So this is New Testament language for referring to the church, individual Christians, and together as a temple. We are the true temple, um, and the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The Holy Spirit is not a gift for super-Christians. It's a reality for every Christian. Notice he says, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you do not belong to Jesus. You're not a real Christian. But if you have Jesus, if you belong to Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. And Paul says that if you have the Holy Spirit, then you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Now, the best way to understand this, as I see it, is to see this as being transferred from one realm to another. I don't know if realm is the best language. It's not the language of the text, but just getting at this idea that we are in the flesh, and then we are taken out of the flesh and put in the Spirit. And so, you're transferred from one to the other. He's contrasting people who are in the flesh and in the Spirit. We saw last week that this is really dividing humanity into two groups. Everyone comes into the world in one group, in the flesh. And then as Jesus rescues people, gives them new life, gives them the Holy Spirit, he's taking them out of the category of the flesh and in the Spirit. So the flesh, referring to our sinful, self-centered nature, we're in this realm where that rules. And the Spirit, of course, is referring to the Holy Spirit. And so you can see, just backing up in this verse, let's just walk through the previous verses here. Verses 5 and 6, he's saying there's two different mindsets and two different destinies associated with these different categories. So he says, those who live according to the flesh, or who are according to the flesh, they're in this category, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, the self-centeredness. But those who live according to the Spirit, or those who are of the, of the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And then here's the destinies, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And then the focus continues in verses 7 and 8, but now he's focusing on what it's like to live in the realm of the flesh. So he says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, and indeed it cannot. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh, in this category, cannot please God. So the flesh realm is what everyone's born into, and now in verse 9, he's focusing on Christians, and he says that Christians have been brought out of that realm, and we are now in the realm of the Spirit. So he's contrasting two whole categories or kinds of people in the world. Here's one way to think about it. As you read through the Bible's storyline from the beginning, when you come to the end of the Old Testament, and you just gather up what you've learned and what you might expect to happen in the future, you are expecting all of history to be split between two ages, this current age and the age to come. You see that this current age is marked by this flesh, this dominance of our selfishness and sin and death, and then you see that this new age is going to come that will be eternal life and peace. God will send His Messiah, King. God will establish His kingdom. He will raise His people from the dead. He will renew creation itself and bring in a new creation, a new heavens and new earth. He will judge the world. He will pour out His Holy Spirit and bring flourishing to all God's people in that new creation. And the Old Testament led people to see history as two ages, the sinful age and that future age to come. We could call this age the age of the flesh, and we could call that coming age the age of the Spirit. But what happens as we turn the page to the New Testament? Well, we learn that the fullness of that age of the Spirit is yet to come. But we also learn that that age of the Spirit has broken in to our present age. And now we're living in the overlap of these ages. The old sinful age of the flesh, sin, and death goes on, and yet the new age of the Spirit and life and peace is here. And Christians are taken out of this old age and plopped into the age of the Spirit, living in an overlap, but we're already tilting forward and in 
the age to come, though we wait for its fullness to be there. And we see that all these expectations have begun. The Messiah did come. Jesus Christ has come. The Messiah is reigning. He is enthroned in heaven as king right now. The Holy Spirit that would be poured out has been poured out beginning the day of Pentecost, the surge of renewal that happened. The world was judged in Christ as all, their, all the Christian sins were put on Jesus in his death, this judgment that happened in the middle of history. And resurrection happened. Jesus is the first one raised from the dead. And the New Testament's very clear. That's not some random, abnormal, totally unique thing. It's just the first of many yet to come. It's the beginning of a harvest yet to come. And those who trust in him actually already experience spiritual resurrection themselves, made alive, resurrected spiritually by the power of the Spirit, though we wait for our bodies to be resurrected in the fullness of the age to come. So, the gift of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is not just a random kind of sideshow blessing. It is the presence of the age to come already here. The gift of the Holy Spirit is a foretaste of the new creation, the new world to come that's already started. He's viewed as a down payment of the age to come. It's the experience of God's presence that's yet to come. He sets us free from the powers of this old age of sin and death and selfishness. He dwells in us as the new temple. So here's why I'm filling this out. Because this is part of what Paul has in mind. He's been talking this way through Romans. He talks in this way all over the place. And this is what he has in mind when he says, we are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. The age of sin and flesh and death is still here, but the new age of life and peace in the Spirit is now also here. There's an overlap. And so we're taken out of the old age. We're put into the new age already, this new realm of the Spirit and this new realm of spiritual life. So this is why Paul is saying here in verse 9, you, however, Christian, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Because if the Spirit of God dwells in you, it's in every Christian, then you are taken out of that old realm altogether, and you are put into this new realm here, the realm of the life-giving Spirit. Now, you may be thinking, this seems a bit detached from my everyday lived experience. This all sounds intriguing, maybe even amazing if true, but my everyday life feels so mundane. I get up, I do my daily routines, I go to sleep, I get up again, I still struggle with sin and selfishness. So how does this idea of being in the realm of the Spirit apply to my lived experience? Well, the short answer is that the Apostle Paul here is, well, part of what it means to be a Christian, the New Testament would say, is learning to live our everyday realities in light of these spiritual realities. It's learning to adjust to this being what we know to be true. It takes a sanctified imagination to do this. I don't even mean imagination like we're making things up. I mean that that we are believing actually what is true, though we may not see it in front of us. I mean, we have to use our minds to see that this is true. So, think of a woman living in Indiana during World War II. She wakes up, she goes through her morning routine, she eats breakfast, she goes about her normal tasks in the day, but though she's never seen the front lines of battle, she feels the weight of the war. She knows its threat. She feels its oppression. She fears the outcome if Hitler and others are successful. And then D-Day comes. She's not there on the other side of the planet, but she hears the news. She still goes to bed. She still wakes up. She still eats her breakfast. She still does those things that she normally does. But she, she knows that these things are true, and so she is set free. She, she, the day is brighter. The sun shines brighter to her. She's filled with hopefulness and eagerness about just the wrap-up of the war. She's relieved, calmed because of that reality. That's the life of a Christian. We know that the realm of darkness has been 
decisively defeated and is fading. The new realm of the Spirit has, is shining already into this age, and Christians are transferred into this new realm. We have a Father who loves us. We have a Christ who died for us. We have a Spirit who dwells in us. So the Christian life is in part about adjusting our thoughts and our emotions and our wills and our lives to these realities. Does that make sense? So when we experience or we hear about true revival happening, that can help us understand this. A revival is not God doing something fundamentally different than what He normally does. Revival is when God does what He normally does, but in a surprising measure, on overdrive. It means that we, it's when we see the joy and the peace and the freedom and worship happening of true revival, what we're doing is we're seeing what is possible for all of us and what's already happening in measure for every Christian, and we're seeing how it can surge in surprising ways. What's already at work, perhaps in a smaller measure in our lives, is an overdrive in revival. And so revival can teach us to long for more. So here's what we're seeing so far. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. And that means that you are taken out of the old realm of the flesh. You are in the new age that's broken into the present. And you are participating in the powers of that coming age that's already here. So that's the first reality for all who have the Spirit. Now second, second reality is this. You experience new life by the Spirit. This is verse 10. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, it's interesting. Paul doesn't say if the Spirit is in you this time. This time he says if Christ is in you. The two persons, the Spirit and the Son, are closely related. When Paul thinks of the Spirit dwelling within us, he's also thinking about Christ dwelling within us. And what's the result? He says, although the body's dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. So what does this mean? Well, when he says the body is dead because of sin, he's probably referring to how our our physical bodies are condemned to death because of sin in the world. Ever since Adam sinned, death entered the world and everybody dies. Everybody, everybody's body is headed toward the ground. When you become a Christian, that doesn't change. Your body is still going to die. Jesus doesn't come back before that happens. But if Christ is in us, what difference does that make? Well, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. So he's saying, although our bodies are condemned to death, the spirit indwells us and brings new life. And this is because of righteousness, which I take to refer in some sense to the saving righteousness that God gives us, that Paul's talked about in various ways through Romans. And the key word in all of this is life. This is what the Spirit gives. This is the great gift of the new realm of the Spirit. This is saying if Christ is in you, you have life. You have real life. Not just the promise of an endless number of days through eternity, but you have the life that everyone's really searching for and longing for. Aren't we all alive and yet searching for true life? I mean, isn't that, what's go- isn't that kind of the human project everywhere? We're alive, but we want to feel fully alive. And we seek it in different ways. We search for it. Some search for it by keeping up appearances. They feel alive when people think that they're amazing. We try to hold back the decline of our mortal bodies and aging, and that doesn't work. Others try to find it in external changes, like more money, They arrive and then they need more or more success or accomplishments. But one day those stop as well and they're ultimately insecure. One day, someone was just sharing this with me this past week. I thought it was really insightful. One day, maybe 10 or 20 years from now, if you have a workplace that you go to with a number of people, maybe 10 or 20 years from now, nobody there will remember you worked there. No one will remember your accomplishments. No one will remember your name. Uh, This is true for all of us. You may make a name for yourself, but it will probably be forgotten. And even if you make it for a while, your body is condemned to death because of sin. 
And yet the great reality is this. If Christ is in you, you have life, the source of real life, the abundant life that he promised to give, the fullness of life. You were made to know God, and you have God dwelling within you. Couldn't be nearer, couldn't be more personal. You have the life of the world to come, already beating in your heart. You have the Spirit's presence of the world to come, already actively engaged at the core of your personality. You have the fullness of joy in the world to come, already planted in your heart as a seed. So this is what true revival is all about. Revival is about the Spirit giving life and renewing and reviving life. It's about the Spirit satisfying us with the presence of God. It's about the Spirit causing us to view our idols as worthless as they are and to repent of our sins. It's about the Spirit leading us to turn away from our empty ambitions and see the beauty of Christ. It's about the Spirit giving us a taste for the joys to come, satisfying us with those joys and giving us a hunger for more. Revival happens when our anxieties are calmed by His presence, when our aims in life are redirected toward the glory of God, when our burdens are given to Jesus to bear. And this revival power is planted inside every Christian by the Spirit. And this reviving reality is not just for the present life, but for life in the world to come. It's the last reality for all who have the Spirit. Your body will be resurrected through the Spirit. This is verse 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So here's the logic. God the Father raised the Lord Jesus, God the Son, by the power of God the Holy Spirit. And that same Spirit is dwelling in you already. The Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, dwelling in you. And that Spirit is leaning toward and pressing toward the day when He doesn't just have you give, this, give you this new experience of resurrection life inside you, but your, your body is raised from the dead and given life forever. The Spirit is waiting to do for you what He already did to the Lord Jesus in raising Him from the dead. That day is coming for you. Jesus is just the beginning. So Jesus' resurrection is not viewed as an utterly unique moment in human history. It is that in so many ways, but it's also the first of many to come. It's the first fruits of a crop, and we're the crop. And if the Spirit is in you, then that Spirit will, you'll be raised through that same Spirit. So the Spirit is the great gift of the world to come, the life-giving power of God, and He's already present in human beings through faith in Jesus. So when we die, our body goes to the ground, our spirit, our the part we can't see of ourselves, right, with Jesus in heaven. Uh, but that's not our eternal destiny. We're waiting for the day when our immaterial self, our spirit, is reunited with our body. The Holy Spirit, by the power of the Spirit, God raises us from the dead, and we're fully alive as embodied human beings, filled with life forever. There is no ultimate dichotomy between spirit and body or the Holy Spirit and the human body, right? The Spirit is eager to give life to human bodies and empower them to live and be used for God's glory forever. So, the resurrection power is in Jesus, so this is a calming hope. We have plenty of aches and pains and brokenness in our bodies, and it will be reversed. Whatever pain you go through now is temporary. It means that as your body powers down, which it seems to do from the moment we're born, in some senses, and then certainly when we hit 30s, it will get powered back up one day. So those are the three realities for all who have the Holy Spirit. Being a Christian is in part learning to 
use our spirit-sanctified imaginations to see the truth of these realities and to live in light of them and to have our thoughts and our emotions and our lives adjust to these realities, to live as if these are actually true for us, because they are. So just a few final reflections, implications. I want to apply this to how we think about the possibility of revival today. So nine reflections on revival in general, the life-giving power of the Spirit uh, from this text or in light of this text, and then we'll be done. First, revive, and by the way, I'm doing this because revival is a biblical wonder. It's something God loves to do through human history, and whether or not things have been happening around us that we might call revival today, we should be thinking about this and longing for it and hoping for it. And when it does happen, we should be able to think about it in a sane way. Okay, so first, revival is a reality because of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is, as we say in the Nicene Creed, the giver of life. The Holy Spirit brings renewal and revival. Because, and because the Spirit is active, revival is a reality. Second, revival is the breaking in of the powers of the age to come. So the age to come is not just unending existence, but it is the age of unending renewal and revival. We will be fully alive. And that will be the age of the Spirit where God's presence will saturate the new creation and His people, and that life of the world to come is already broken in to our presence as a result of Jesus' resurrection, ascension, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And every Christian receives the Holy Spirit and is in the realm of the Spirit. That's what we're seeing from Romans 8. And that Spirit is powerfully working in God's people. That's part of Paul's argument in Romans 8 so far. We saw last week, obedience to God was impossible before you become a Christian, and it's inevitable after. Why? Because you're in the realm of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit transforms you. Third, revival is an acceleration of the ordinary work of the Spirit. The ordinary work of the Spirit is miraculous. Revival is when He does these miracles in extraordinary measures. So I've shared before, I think of revival like those yellow speed arrows in Mario Kart. Amazing game. They're called uh, boost panels. So when you drive on them in this little racing game, you surge ahead at max speed. I actually think now that there's a better illustration for this, still for Mario Kart. When you play Mario Kart, there's a number of items you get, right? Red shells to launch and destroy for a few seconds, your uh, enemies you're racing against. Um, throw shells around at other racers and these things, bananas they slip on. But if you fall behind the, in the race far enough, then, and you're lagging behind, you start getting certain items to help you in your lagging situation. And one item you can get is called the bullet bill, where you're basically transformed into this giant bullet and you just surge ahead and you might have been in 12th place and you land in like four seconds, you're in third place all of a sudden. You just get totally caught up and make up all this lost ground. That's revival. Where, where we are, where we are lagging and Maybe, maybe that, you know, we were in third or fourth place before in, in a manner of speaking, right? And then all of a sudden, we feel kind of dry and like, is anyone coming to Christ? And like, man, do we even care? I just feel like, man, where is the spiritual vitality? We're kind of lagging. And revival is this bullet that God gives us where we're transformed for a short period of time doing the ordinary things we would have done, driving and going around the track, but we're just surging forward. Again, it's, it's what God does in a few days, which is typical of what He does over the course of a few years. Ordinary things that He usually does, but He's ratcheting it way up. More people are coming to Christ more quickly than we're used to. More Christians are repenting of their sins, taking Christ seriously, laying their empty ambitions aside, and surging for renewal. Fourth, we have the power of revival working in us already now. 
Every single Christian has the giver of life within them. The same spirit that brought revival that we read about in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people in one day, and then they're transformed, sharing life together, devoting themselves to prayer and the apostles' teaching and giving to the needy and all these things. That Holy Spirit that did that is in you. That same power is in you. That gives us all sorts of hope and expectancy and longing. Fifth, revival is marked by the fruit of the Spirit. Revival is the Spirit's work, and we know from the pages of the New Testament what kind of work the Spirit loves to produce. And it's not crazy weirdness. It's patience, gentleness, love, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, right? All the fruit of the Spirit. It produces humility and love. Another way to say it is that the Spirit's work is to make us like Jesus. So, if a revival happens, we're expecting the making like Jesus work of the Holy Spirit to be happening in spades. So, the place should look and smell like Jesus. We should look and smell like Jesus. We should fe- people should feel like Jesus has shown up here. This kind, loving, compassionate, faithful man. That's what we should become like. Another way to say it is that the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. He's the Spirit of holiness. This is what He produces in His people. So, if there's an outpouring of the Spirit's work, we will expect to see an outpouring of these kinds of qualities and holiness pursued among us. Sixth, we can't manufacture revival. Revival is something the Spirit does. We don't create it. We cannot plan when it should happen. We can't manipulate this. We can't schedule it. We're not going to strong arm God into making it happen. And we don't want to pretend. I've heard of examples of other locations where revival seems to be occurring. People are inspired what they hear elsewhere and it stirs them as well. And it seems like the Spirit uses that and stirs it and spreads. I've also heard of, of someone at another location in college that feels like the leaders are kind of trying to manipulate this. Let's just plug the game plan what we saw over there. Um, But the Spirit blows wherever He wills. And we can't uh, reverse engineer this kind of thing into happening. You can't force it. You can seek it. And we should. We can pray for it. And we should. We can plead for it. And we should. We can eagerly hope for it, and we should. And if the Lord gives it, we thank Him for it, and we steward it. Seventh, revival is real, but a true revival in this age will not be perfect. A real revival can take root somewhere, but that doesn't mean that every person in that area is experiencing it, or maybe experiencing it yet. And other people may be drawn to a revival and fake their own experience of it. And Satan may want to use, the, use revivals to discredit the revival by, by stirring weird excesses in the revival. Someone once put it this way, every revival, this is, this isn't, there's no Bible verse that says this exactly, but the point, every real revival is 70% real, 20% fake, and 10% satanic. Who knows? But you get the idea that all three can be happening, and that does not mean real revival's not happening. Don't let the excesses discredit what's happening and what the Lord is doing in the main, and then don't let what the Lord is doing in the main make you gullible to assume that everything you see that's happening is from the Holy Spirit. The key here is to embrace and celebrate what the Lord is doing without being undiscerning, which then is eighth, our posture toward rumors of revival should be thoughtful eagerness. It should not be cynicism. It should not be also a thoughtless embrace of anything that claims to be revival. Revivals can be fake. Satan's work can be present as well, and he can mimic it. People can use revivals for their own agendas, but that shouldn't change our, us from having a posture of hopefulness. We should always hope that what we hear is true, and we should long for the Spirit to be working. That should be our default posture, not quick to come across as some kind of, you know, smart critic that knows how to evaluate everything and has to give 
a cynical take on things. And finally, let your prayer for revival begin with yourself. Christ is in you. You have life. So let's enjoy this life personally, individually. Let's enjoy this life together as a church family. And let's give ourselves to the Spirit's rule in our life and turn our hearts to Him. If you have never come to Christ and received the Holy Spirit, you can. Maybe you have this morning. You can right now. Open yourself up to Him. Give yourself to the Lord Jesus. He died for your sins. You can be forgiven. And He pours out the Holy Spirit. You can change. And if you have received the Holy Spirit, if you're following Jesus, then long for and ask for more. That's really the word that, that comes most to my mind when I think of revivals. It's asking God to do more. He's working. Would you do more? He's working over there. Would you do more here? He's working here. Would you do more in that area over there? We long for him to do more. So why don't we pray right now? I'll just give a few moments of silence for you to pray uh, in light of these things, and I'll close this and we'll, and we'll sing. Father, we thank you for working to revive and renew and give new life among our lives and our church family. So many in this room have memories and stories of when you first made yourself real to them. It might have been another country or another state or another town. It could have been right here in this room. But you've been active and powerful by your Holy Spirit. And so we together thank you for all that you've done. We thank you that you have been working through human history long before we showed up on the planet. And you have been a God who loves to give life and pour out your love and grace. We thank you for all the reviving work you've done. Thank you for giving life to every person whom you've saved through human history. Thank you for bringing surges of renewal and revival to places throughout history. And we thank you for what you are doing around the globe today. And we long for you to do it more. And so we pray that you would give us a humble, low posture before you and an eagerness for you to do what only you can do and what you love to do. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to close by just singing these words uh, from Romans 8, uh, verses 10 and 11. So there's a church in Nashville that's been putting Romans 8 to music. So I've enjoyed hearing some of those as we've been uh, preaching through Romans 8. Uh, and so this is verses 10 and 11. So let's stand together as we sing these words. Um, if Christ is in you, you have life. If Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, you have life. Sing that again. But if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, you have life. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, 
you have life. If the Spirit, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, dwells in you, He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your body. His Spirit, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, you have life. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, you have If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, dwells in you, He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your body through His Spirit. If Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, you have life. Sing that one more time. If Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, you have life. Well, what a privilege to exist and to exist in this world with this God and this kind of work that he loves to do and that he is doing among us and that we long for more. The fruit of the Spirit's work will look very much like the fruit we've seen him be doing among us because he has been at work among us. So even as we just go out of this room, the way that we sincerely love each other as we say hi, as we engage in conversation, as we ask someone we don't know for their name and express interest, genuine interest, uh, that all is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so forth. Uh, so let's enjoy the Spirit's work and long for Him to do more. So we'll go with this benediction from God's Word. And a reminder about benedictions. Benedictions are uh, expectations for what only God can do. And so what we're doing is we're saying to the Lord, we need you to do what you've done here. We need you to do it in everyday life. But it's not just a prayer or a hope. It's an expectation. Benedictions are about expected blessings from the Lord. Um, which is why we put out our hands. And I put out my hands because I'm receiving it with you from him, from the Lord as we go. So it's a short one, but fitting in light of today. Now may the Lord direct our hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Go in peace to make disciples.